Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. In today's video we're going to be diving headfirst into the world of cybersecurity with a focus on one of the oldest but also most common hacking techniques there is out there, brute force. Brute force is exactly what it sounds like. Imagine you're trying to break into the device the same way that a burglar would try to break down the front door to gain access to your house. It's not pretty but it can be quite effective if your defenses aren't up to date. Brute force is old it's almost as old as modern computing the first documented instance of it was in 1977 in a paper by the cryptologist whitfield dinfey and martin hellman and those were two smart individuals who created the dinfey hellman key exchange which is a way of securely exchanging cryptographic keys now before i show you how you can do a brute force attack i want to talk a little bit about the mitre attack framework the Miter Attack Framework is a meticulously crafted playbook that is filled with the tactics and techniques that are employed by threat actors. Attack stands for Adversarial Tactics, Techniques and Common Knowledge, by the way. Now, this was developed by the Miter Corporation and this framework provides a detailed map of how attackers operate. It's an invaluable resource for cybersecurity professionals to understand and defend against various cyber threats because it doesn't only show you what the attacks are, it shows you recent examples of the attacks, mitigation methods and detection methods. In fact, uh, let's find, here it is, brute force. Brute force is listed as T1110 in the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And you can see here, there are four sub techniques here. So let's go through, we can see recent examples, we can see mitigation strategies and also detection methods. Of the four sub techniques, the simplest one to perform, but does take the most amount of time is 001, guessing. Whether that's by human or an automated bot, the process is the same. Is it username A, password A? No. How about username B, password A? No. And so on and so forth until the right combination is found. Humans, humans are slow at this, but bots, they can try hundreds, if not thousands of combinations a second. And you can use this security tool from security.org to see how fast your password can be cracked. So let's see what password is. P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D. That can be cracked instantly. But let's try something a little bit more complex. Let's try red unicorn. 1996 okay that's going to take about nine million years not really something that you need to worry about but let's make it a little bit more complex let's make it exclamation capital r 3d capital u and exclamation point c zero r N, and then exclamation point nine nine five exclamation point ah oh, that's gonna take <laughs> that's gonna take a trillion years to crack um well i think the sun may have expanded and eaten the earth before your password gets guessed either by a machine or a human unless they were insanely lucky there are more sophisticated types of brute force attacks so if we go back to the mitre framework we can see 002 password cracking 003 password spraying and 004 which is credential stuffing these are all similar in attack but different in execution if we go back to our burglar analogy from before 002 password cracking is like bringing lock picking tools and not a sledgehammer 003 password spraying is like bringing a bunch of different keys for a similar style lock and 004 credential stuffing is like finding the key for the door making a mold and then coming back later with a copy the way that password cracking works is that a threat actor gains access to a list of usernames or passwords and then they use those in combination. So instead of username A, password B, it's, is it admin admin? No. Is it admin password? Yes. Maybe it is. Password spraying is using common passwords with known admin accounts. Something like admin admin, admin password, admin password 1. If at any point I've actually said your password, you should change it, by the way. Credential stuffing is where a list of usernames and passwords are dumped online after a compromise. 
A threat actor usually takes this information and uses it to gain access to the system. To demonstrate this type of attack, I have a lab environment set up in VirtualBox. And if you want to follow along with me, you can. I have a document here that you can follow along and it shows you exactly how to set up the network that I have for you. This video, by the way, is for educational purposes only. If you are going to do this, you should do so only on your own equipment or on equipment that you have express consent to do this on. The two devices on our network will be a Kali Linux machine and the second one will be a Metasploitable 2 machine. Kali is a operating system that is used by cybersecurity professionals to help discover and mitigate issues with network and operating system security issues. And Metasploitable 2 is a VM created by Rapid7 and is designed to be deliberately vulnerable, which is perfect for practicing penetration testing and honing your hacking skills in a safe and controlled environment. You can look at it like a digital laboratory where you can experiment with various hacking techniques and tools without causing any real harm. Metasploitable 2 is intentionally loaded with hundreds of security weaknesses, allowing you to simulate all sorts of real world scenarios and challenges. The tool we'll be using in Kali Linux today is a tool called Hydra. Hydra comes pre-installed on Kali Linux devices. However, if it isn't installed on yours, you can install it by typing in the following command. Hydra was created in 2000 by a group called The Hacker's Choice. Uh, that's thc.org if you want to learn more about them. What this tool allows you to do is use a list of usernames and passwords that you feed into it via a text document. And the cool thing about it is, is that it paralyzes the login cracker, which allows you to use more than one combination of username and password at a time. So I know that the Metasploitable 2's username and password are MSF admin and MSF admin. Super secure, right? So what I've done to demonstrate how Hydra works is that I've put a list of 10 usernames and passwords in these text files here on the desktop. So a savvy hacker wouldn't have just 10 in a text file. He might have something like 10 million if it's a broad attack. Or if it's very specific, they might have a few dozen or so. First up, let's grab the IP address for the Metasploitable machine. So you can grab it from the Metasploitable 2 console with an if config command, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna do this all through the, uh, the Kali Linux device. And we're gonna do it with a tool called Nmap. Nmap scans the network and gives you back a list of every device that's on the network with an IP and a list of other information, including which ports that are open which is good for us because what we want to do is exploit a few of those open ports. Specifically, we want to exploit port 21 FTP and port 22 SSH. What we want to do is find out the username and password for the Metasploitable device and then gain access to the console remotely. So let's go ahead and scan our network with the command nmap dash capital A and then the network address, which is 10.2.0 slash 24 and we'll just run a quick scan of the network here okay so it looks like it's finished up the scan here and took about 34 seconds so let's go ahead and see what we've got here and this looks to be right we've got the metasploitable device here it's metasploitable.localadmin let's just scroll all the way up to the top Okay, so we can see the IP address is 10.0.2.5. Yours might be different than what you can see here. And we can also see that port 21 and port 22 are open. So FTP and also SSH are open, which is great. So now let's try and gain access to the system. So I'm just going to close this and open a terminal here. So now let's try and gain access to the system using the following command. So it's Hydra dash capital L, usernames dash capital P, passwords, and then the IP address, and then the protocol we're using, so FTP. Now you can alter this command depending on the amount of information you have. 
for example, if you had the username, you would change the capital L to a lowercase l, and then you would take out the username file and then you would put in the username. And the same for the password. If you knew the password, it's a lowercase p, and then pop in the password there. This is useful if you were trying to attack one specific account, like the admin account, for instance, and you didn't know the password. Or maybe you lucked into finding plain text password somewhere and you're trying to get into someone's account, but you don't know the username. Now, I do know the username and password for the Metasportable 2 device, but for demonstrative purposes, I will show you how to do it if you don't have any info. And that's with the following command, Hydra, all lowercase, dash capital L, usernames, which is the name of the, fo uh, the file here, capital, uh, dash capital P, password, which again is just the file name, the IP address followed by FTP, which is the protocol that we're trying to exploit. So you may have noticed that I right click to open a terminal on the desktop here. And the reason I've done that is because the username and password files are on the desktop. If you're using Hydra, the easiest way to do it will be to save those files to the desktop and then right click and open the terminal, uh, the desktop in the terminal or to CD into the desktop and then run the files that way. That's why I say it's easier just to keep them on the desktop and then open desktop in terminal or CD into the desktop rather than having to write the full file name in the in the command. So let's hit enter on this now and see it do its magic. And because those username and passwords had the MSF admin account at number one, it checked those first, so it was fairly quick. So what we can now do is we can take this information here and we can use that to gain access to the Metasploitable 2 device through SSH. And how we would do that is we would do the command SSH MSF admin, and then the IP address of 10.0.2.5, then hit enter. Now you might get this error on screen, and this just means that the SSH client and our Kali Linux machine are having issues agreeing on a suitable key to initialize the handshake between the two devices. And a workaround for that is to do the following command. Then we type in the MSF admin password, which is MSF admin. And we can see here that we are now logged in. So let's do a who am I command. Perfect, so here we are. So we are MSF admin and we are logged into the Metasploitable device. From here, you can do whatever you wanna do. So let's, um. Let's try and add a new user account. So let's do sudo user add, and then let's do Kali. And then msf admin is the sudo password. And let's add a new password to that. Let's do uh, sudo pass. Word, Kali, and let's just do Kali, and Kali again, excellent, so let's exit this, and now let's try and log in using the new user account that we've just created, so Kali, and Kali, Excellent, so we're now logged in as the new user account that we just created. And let's list some things here. Uh, CD, USR. Cool, so now we've got access to everything that this user would have, but I don't want access to this account here. Let's go ahead and exit that. Let's go back into MSF admin and let's see if there's something else that we can do here. So let's MSF admin. Um, I want to see what I can take from you. Cool. So there's a folder here called vulnerable. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to use the following command. Let's create a new terminal window. So let's go ahead and copy this over with SCP and because
because I needed assistance with our host key algorithms before, I'm going to need that again as well. And let's go ahead and just confirm this command here. So SCP dash zero host key algorithms equals plus SH minus RSA minus R MSF admin IP address and vulnerable. Vulnerable. And then we're copying to the desktop. MSF admin. Excellent. So now we're copying our files across and we can see everything's coming across here and this is copying too. And let's see what we got here. So we've got a few things here. So let's try and see what it's actually copied. So this is what it's copied over to our desktop and let's see what's actually in this vulnerable file here. So it's CD to vulnerable ls and it looks like it's copied everything across. So we've got the mysql-ssl, uh, samba or samba and tiki wiki and tiki wiki 2003-201. Cool. So that's been successful and it's done everything there. Excellent. Now that was very quick and yes, this was a lab environment. Yes, I did have a lot of the information beforehand, but this is still an attack that is used every day and that's because it works. And the way to stop these kinds of attacks are shown in the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So let's go back there now. You have to use things like account use policies, like locking out accounts that have tried multiple failed passwords, policies that block external IPs or untrusted IP addresses from accessing the network, things like multi-factor authentication or password policies, making sure that easily guessed passwords or reused passwords aren't used. To detect these types of attacks, you're looking for a type of software called a SIEM, S-I-E-M, which is a security information and event management system. This collects data like failed login attempts and alerts you to the fact that there's an issue. There are dozens of SIEM tools out there. Some of them are open source and free. Some of them are paid tools. Some of them are a combination of the two. And these SIEM tools don't just detect brute force. They detect many different types of attacks. Depending on which SIEM you're using, something like Waza or Splunk, they can scan the network and tell you if your system is vulnerable to anything in the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And then they will walk you through how to fix or mitigate the issue that they find on the network. I won't dive into which tools you should use on your end or how to use them in, in this video. You should do your own research on that and pick up the best tool to monitor your network because every network is different and what's good for someone might not be good for you. But that's it for today's video. I hope that you've learned something. And if you did, leave a like or a comment down below, which is appreciated. If you want more content like this, hit the subscription button down below. And until next time, keep learning and take care.